it's been well documented, you know, like uh, Xanadu, Coleridge, Butters, The Velvet, all things like that, all great edgy beauty comes out of heroin and opium. Well, that honeymoon period ends really quick. My name's John Doran, and I write about music. In the past, on British Masters for Noisy, I've spoken to everyone from Liam Gallagher to Viv Albertine via Dizzy Rascal and Brian Ferry. It's arguable that my guest today, Michael Head, is the least well-known of all of these interviewees, while still comfortably among the most talented of them. Coming from a city that effortlessly incubates idiosyncratic cult songwriters, even when placed next to Lee Mavers, Bill Ryder-Jones and Ian McCulloch, Mick Head is clearly someone with a special gift. Not only did the NME famously put him on the cover, calling him the country's greatest songwriter, but Noel Gallagher also once signed him to his label. He has a discography recorded with the Pale Fountains, Shack, and more recently the Red Elastic Band that most songwriters would kill for. A run of poor luck and long-standing substance abuse issues means he has never quite found the audience he deserves. Even if it's by accident, however, Mick has ended up playing the long game and future generations will come to regard him as some kind of genius. So there's like a popular kind of like narrative about Mick Head, which goes something like genius songwriter, bedeviled by bad luck and some lifestyle choices, never found the kind of audience that he deserved, bar from a bunch of drunk music journalists and a cult following. But Obviously, that's not really the whole picture, is it? There, there's, it's more kind of up and down than that. And like, for example, you know, when you first got signed as Pale Fountains, that was for 150 grand, wasn't it? Yeah. And what year was that in? 82. I mean, that was a phenomenal amount of money, wasn't it? It was a shared load of money. What's this? We were literally living on Ken, Kenny um, in our mum and dad's to the Columbia within the space of a couple of weeks. It wasn't a big deal, believe it or not, with, within the band. It, we, it was a more of a big deal to the media um, and li- our friends in Liverpool. All the big deal about the money, we didn't really understand it. It was like, oh, and like so, and there was a lot of fun. So obviously the idea of you being a songwriter is kind of key to like the kind of like narrative about you. Do you find it comes naturally to you? At school, my favourite subject was English. So I, I was always loving writing essays. I always had that interest in stories, expressing myself with word. And obviously when you're 17 and you're watching things like Revolver and punks happening, and it's all happening. and. Um, yeah, I thought I want to be in a band and then couldn't play an instrument at all, but got into a band in a way playing keyboards with one finger. And then once I was in that environment, started getting more confident, um, decided I wanted to write my own songs. I always knew I'd have good ideas once I'd mastered the guitar, if you like. So I, I thought it'd be all right. Yeah. Hey, she tread softly. I was thinking about this when I was watching that You'll Never Walk Alone documentary and I was thinking about like your roots in punk rock and stuff like that. And, like, we're so kind of used to hearing about the impact that punk had in London and Manchester. You never hear in the media about the impact that it had in other cities. But of course it was big in Liverpool, wasn't it? I was lucky to live close to town. So there was a shop called Probe. I know Probe, uh, yeah, that's great. So everyone went to Probe. So I got introduced to it quite early. So he's 76, he's 77, because there was a lad on Kenny called Chez, one of them fellas who you probably know who was always ahead of the, the game. Yeah. 
and he'd take me into town with all the other punks. You've, you've talked about these bands who came directly after punk, and it's like, you know, like I would guess the most prominent bands would be Teardrop Explodes and Echo and the Bunny Men. Did you know all those people in like big in Japan? And... When I left school, I used to work in a place as a tea boy repairing cameras. So the Bunny Men would be walking past every day, Will with his velvet underground leather jacket on. Uh, the teardrops would be walking past Wiley, so all the bands would be there. What got me was a pro was so it goes, and that just blew me away. And luckily for me, I bumped into one of them the next day and said to him, like, you, you were amazing last night, and I had similar clothes on to him. He said, can you play instruments? I said, no. He said, can you sing? I said, yeah. He said, well, the place I rehearse in, with the bunny men, the lad whose house it is, we don't use it at the weekend, so we use his our equipment. He's looking for a singer. So I thought, great. And so that was my introduction to all them, really, to, to meeting them. But was this the genesis of Pale Fountains then? Yeah. A lad called Yorki, who would want to brainwash you with beautiful music, you know? Yeah. And I just got to say, like, no to, like, Henry Cow and Dagmar Cruz and all this and Peru, and I got to love, and I went, that'll do. Yeah. <laughs> so I took that home. And, and that was that then. Well, I should ask you about love. How did you come to meet Arthur? Stefan, this French entrepreneur, if you like, Stefan had said, Arthur Lee's looking for someone to back him. Phone this manager up in LA. I'll give you the money. He wants to talk to you. So I phoned him up and he asked me, are you interested in forming love? And I'm thinking to myself, yes. And he asked me, what love songs do you know? So I said, all of them. And he said, don't be daft. And I said, I'm not messing. My first gig was in Paris. And we were supposed to meet Arthur in the afternoon in a cafe. And about eight in the morning, I had a big kicking at the door like that. And I thought it was the chambermaid. So I opened the door like, and uh, I'm six foot four man. Michael! Arthur, I'm in my undies. You know what I mean? So uh, come in. He was just cool and laid back and he was just so normal, natural. So we got on really well. I mean, what if any, you know, kind of like lessons about music did, did you learn from him? Just his lyrics are just so surreal, diverse, and not surreal really, just beautiful in his interpretation of, of, and his perception of situations and life. And when you look at them and, you know, you see some of them pictures with the stripy kecks and the haircuts and the shades and that, and then you hear the music. What more do you want? You know, it's like, amazing. Let's talk about War Pistol because that's almost like, like it's a catalogue of disastrous stuff happening, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Thinking about, like, some of these really big albums that, you know, should have done better or whatever, was it a failure of people outside the band or was it a case of timing or like a mixture of both of those things? We started doing demos for it early doors, say like 89 or something. And it had difference, as you know, Start, stops and starts. And um, it was that time, it was the early 90s, so there was bound to be a bit of confusion, a bit of um, misinterpretation. So by the time, it, ultimately got recorded. It had, had maybe two or three different producers working on it. We were just going through the motions, you know? Because people say to me, like, how were you feeling then with Water Pistol? The car, this, that and the other. Were you in bits? And I have to say, like, you'd think so, wouldn't you? No, you move on. So around this period, like, you know, how ubiquitous were, like, kind of hard drugs in Liverpool? And I'm vaguely aware that it's felt like that Merseyside had more of an entrenched heroin problem than nearly anywhere else I've ever been. Yeah. What was it like where you were at the time? Yeah, it was the same as it had been in every city. It was flooded. There was never really any droughts. I know when it first hit Kenny, in the, in the late 70s, the early 80s. I think John Ronson did an amazing piece for, for The Guardian for it, where basically it was after the riots, and they basically said, are we gonna shut these up? Flood the streets with smack, which is what they did, and everyone shut up. 
but did you think that you had a different attitude towards the drug than a lot of other people who were using it at the time because you'd already embarked on a career as like an artist? Yeah, I got completely into the romanticised side of the drug. It's been well documented, you know, like uh, Xanadu, Coleridge, Butters, The Velvet, all things like that, all great edgy beauty comes out of heroin and opium. But that honeymoon period ends really quick. Do you know what I mean? So that's how high I got into it, not the, uh, the necessity. It was a totally romanticised view. And when I was deciding to actually whether I was or not getting into it, I was in the rehearsal room and my girlfriend at the time said, well, if you take smack, I'm going to leave you. And outside the rehearsal room, there was three bottle banks, brown, green and clear. It was like a sign and I chose the brown. Finished the song off and that was like the start of my habit. Oh, you've kept your sobriety for a long time now. Um, what do you put your success down to? An amazing support network of people. Um, and not being able to afford it ultimately. Right. After the absolute, what was it, five year kerfuffle over Water Pistol? Yeah. You know, the next album you had out as Shaq was HMS Fable. Yeah. And it's like you cleaned up for that, didn't you? Were you consciously going for a, a kind of like a hit record? I was in a frame of mind where we've got the potential here with this HMS Fable to have some hits. And it was like, well, great. I, I don't actually intentionally write songs. I, I write songs if it sounds like a hit, great. If somebody said that sounds like possibly a hit. It's still going to be the same song. What I'm wondering about is, is like, you know, some of this, you know, idea of you not connecting with this larger audience is like quite a lot of that just down to the fact that you're not interested in the music industry. You're learning every day. You know, you don't really know what the music industry is. It doesn't come with a blueprint or manual, does it? But as, a, as you, the older you get, you know, wise, is that the right word? Common sense kicks in a lot more. All we're doing is what we do, and write songs and write music, and we're going to put it out. But are you more comfortable now that it's essentially just you and a couple of mates doing it as more of a cottage industry? Of course, yeah, definitely. With a major label, you see, they've got different departments of a perception of what they think your song should go. That's what lets a lot of bands in the 80s down. It's just a mishmash of different perceptions from the, the record label. Whereas me and Matt, it's, it's our baby. It's easier to get the right results, ultimately, with a fewer amount of people, I think. So what is it about Red Elastic Band that differentiates it from any of the other bands that you've been in previously? The other bands were, were definite bands that was going to be a band format, where the Red Elastic Band was an idea of a collective of people that evolved around myself and my songs. And it's kind of evolved into this collective of people who come and go. So that's the idea, basically. It's all about the songs. And the Red Elastic Bands is like a catalyst for the, the music. You started wanting changes and said it's right. You can't act all the suitcases Because, in some respects, like, your back catalogue must be a kind of, like, a, a weird kind of diary, do any of your songs cause you any pain now? Yeah. Um, there's one or two... Uh, yeah, there's one or two that I couldn't sing for a while. Uh, there's one on the new album that... I haven't listened to the final mix yet. Winter Turns to Spring is about um, 
leaving home after 25 years and starting again. In times when you would think you would not probably want to pick the guitar up, it's probably the time when you do pick the guitar up. Right. People in, in a support network have said, you don't realise how lucky you are because you've got a guitar. No matter if you've got like a little bit of talent or not, you've got that to go and pick up um, and, and focus on. Do you do anything to kind of keep your head straight, like, I don't know, meditation or long walks or running or whatever? I've got a bike. I do a lot of cycling. No, I haven't tried any, like, different variations on things. Or, do you mean, like, Tai Chi and things like that? And... My mate Jono, he was like, Tai Chi, you know what I mean? That's the thing for someone like me. And I know what he's saying by someone like me. He's like, some, like an ex-drunk who's got balance issues, you know. <laughs> I think it looks all right, you know what I mean? I'm having it, you know. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I'm, I might buy a mat. All right, mate. Thanks very much. Oh, Cheers, thank you, man. That do you, lad? Oh, do you, do you?